my dear friend Rick Renner. I'm going to bring him on in just a moment, but I want to simply say, if you would, repost this right away. We're going to get into some conversation, I'm believing, that will involve his recent trip to Turkey, where he went and viewed the site that is Noah's Ark. And he's going to give some information on that. Also, I want to talk about this last day's end time narrative that I think is really rapidly unfolding in front of our eyes. And it involves the prophecy Jesus gave about the days of Noah. I want to get to that with Rick today, and I'm hoping we can. So please pray for us. But if you would, share this everywhere you can, because I know God is going to speak to somebody through it. Also, I want to thank the partners of this ministry. Thank you so very much for being a part of this today. And if you want to become part of our partner family, please go to josephz.com. And uh, you're going to hear from us. And we're looking to stand up against this culture and bring truth and the good news of Jesus Christ to a generation. So thank you for being here. Please repost this. And would you please help me welcome my friend, the man of God, Rick Renner. Well, I'm just so happy to have Rick Renner with us again today. Rick is one of my dearest friends and also such a leading voice uh, of truth and the gospel all over the world. Rick, welcome. Thank you for being with us again today. Joseph, I'm so glad to be with you. I'd be with you anytime. Thank oh. you for inviting me. Well, thank you, sir. It's, it's such a privilege to be here. You know, everybody who's watching this right now, if you would, please repost this, share this somewhere, because we're going to get into some very important information. Uh, I think it's going to be very beneficial to you. I encourage you to share this, repost this right away. And uh, it's, it's just going to be vital that you hear what we have to talk about today. You know, Rick, you've just recently came back from a very significant trip and you're, you're filming television about it, you're creating some very powerful content, and the trip was to, of all places, Noah's Ark. Can you tell us just a little bit about the trip? Because I have some questions about that, but how was the trip? What was it like going there, Rick? It was wonderful, but Joseph, what's funny is when I tell most people I went to Noah's Ark, they say, ah, we need to get over to Kentucky to see that as well. <laughs> And I always say, well, I've never been to the one in Kentucky. I've been to the one in the mountains of Ararat. Yeah, the real one. <laughs> but, but Joseph, first of all, it is not on Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat is a stratovolcano, and it's erupted and erupted and erupted since the time of the flood. And probably at the time of the flood, it wasn't even very big. Wow. And if Noah's Ark even had landed on that, it would have been blown to bits or covered with lava. In fact, if you look down in the valley, the valley below Mount Ararat itself is just covered with so much lava, and it's thick, thick, thick. Nothing would have survived those eruptions. Wow. But the Bible never says that the ark landed on Mount Ararat. And again, it probably didn't even exist at the time of the flood. And we even know that later in time, in biblical times, that particular peak later was not even called Ararat. Oh, man. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, that the ark rested in the mountains of Ararat. And the mountains of Ararat is a very, very large mountain range. And among those mountains is a very small mountain, which is called Mount Judy. And that's very, very important. It was named Mount Judy sometime in ancient history, of course, after the flood. But the name of Judy means the place of the landing. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing, that the place the of the landing. Of that mountain. And there was an ancient writer, uh, actually there are many ancient writers who recorded that they actually went to see the ark because right at the top of that particular Mount Judy, there's a ridge. Mm. That ridge today is the border with Iran. Okay. Well, ancient writers said that the Silk Road ran on that ridge, and it did. It was right there. That's and amazing. And the people who traveled on the Silk Road would detour on the South on the Silk Road when they were traveling and just walk down the hill to see the ark. It was right there. And so history has verified for a long time, hundreds and even thousands of years, where the ark was. Right. And it's on Mount Judy in the mountains of Ararat. It landed at the top, but the whole side of that mountain is a mudslide. Even today, it's a mudslide. Every spring after the winter, the whole side of the mountain just moves. And the ark moved from the top 
down 1,200 feet to where it is now at about 6,500 feet above sea level. But here's the interesting thing. When all that mud moves, that object never changes. Man. It is a boat-shaped formation. It is a separate object that is just sitting in that mud flow. And the ground-penetrating radar and the ERT scans have revealed rooms within it, and not just rooms, but three different stories in this massive formation. And Joseph, it really is Noah's Ark. It I, really is. You know, it was so amazing looking at photos of you there, what you were, you know, exploring. And if you just look at your social media, you know, you're on Instagram, you're on Facebook, and of course, all of uh, YouTube and whatnot, you're on many places. But I'll tell you, seeing the images of you and your team being there and beginning to build the narrative that you discovered was just tremendous, Rick. And here's the reason I'm so interested in the topic of Noah's Ark and what you're uh, bringing out with it is this. We are living in what Jesus called, I believe, the days of Noah. Just before the Son of Man returns, it'll be like the days of Noah. There's like a prophetic significance to your going there, looking at this and really bringing out the details of Noah's Ark at this time in the culture. And Rick, what do you think? Where do you think we are in the timeline right now? When you go see Noah's Ark, you know the prophecy, we see the current culture. How does that correlate? Where do you see us right now? Well, I want to answer that question, but can I tell you what else I saw first? Oh, please, come on. <laughs> if you study Genesis chapter 10, verse 30, it tells us the first post-flood city was called Misha. Wow. Misha is on the upper slope of where the Ark is. And there, there are settlements from an ancient, ancient civilization. And probably that was the first little city which was built by Noah and his sons. But as the water continued to descend, they began moving down the hill. And finally, they ended up in the lower valley. And in the bottom of that valley, there is an ancient, ancient city. And guess what the name of the city is? The village of eight. Of eight. That's the name of the city. How about and just that? to the side of it, there is a house that is thousands and thousands of years old. Of course, it's just the foundations, but it was always revered as the house of Noah in the village of eight. And it was later converted into a church. That's why it was maintained and not lost. And I really believe those probably are the remnants of Noah's house in what became called the village of eight. And if... The event that we read about in Genesis when Ham came in and exposed his father, but his other brothers came in and protected him. It all happened in that house. And there's something else really amazing. All over that valley, there are 26 drug stones. You know what a drug stone is? I think I do. Anchor? Well, it looks like, it looks like an anchor, but it's not an anchor. Okay, okay. In the ancient world, ships would hang these massive stones from the side to stabilize the ship in bad weather. Well, the ark was massive, and there was never worse weather than the ark was in. Wow. So these massive, massive stones, and Joseph, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you how big they are. They are massive. Wow. And at the top of every one of them is a man-made hole for the rope that was used to dangle them from the sides of the ark. And as the ship began to slow and prepare for landing on what was later called Mount Judy, it began to slow and the waters became more calm. So Noah began to cut those stones. Okay. And so if you follow those stones in the valley, you can actually see the path that the ship took as it turned and finally sailed into those mountains. That I think remarkable. that's amazing. That is amazing. You can see the slowing path of the ship. That Absolutely. is amazing. But you know, when we were there, my son Paul and Joel were with me and my whole team. And my son, Paul, who is the senior pastor of the Moscow Good News Church, he said, Dad, I am so gripped by what I'm seeing. Wow. He said, this is a prophetic statement about the days we're living in. Yes. And I said, that's right, son. And this leads me to your question. Because in Matthew 24, 37, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah before the flood, so shall it be just before the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus said, whatever was happening before the flood is going to be replicated again at the end of the age, and that's the days that we're living in. So if you look back to what was happening before the flood, it was really a bizarre time in history. 
we know from ancient writings, many of them connected to the Bible, but they're not biblical writings. For example, the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is very serious. Yes. Now, it's not a biblical book. It's not right. inspired by God, but it is serious commentary, so serious. Jesus quoted it. Jude quoted it. Peter quoted it. James quoted it. John quoted it. That's pretty serious. In the first century, people were obsessed with the book of Enoch because it was prophetic about future events. And in the book of Enoch, it says that the watchers, these were angels that God set in the earth to watch over man after the exit from the garden. God That's loved right. man so much that he dispatched angels to help mankind through their struggles. Wow. And the angels became obsessed with women who were especially beautiful at that time. And if you read both what Peter and Jude say, they're quoting the book of Enoch. Wow, amazing. And they say the angels left their first estate or they left the post that God assigned them to and they went after strange flesh. And that's described in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, 2, and verse 4, when the Bible says the sons of God, that's an Old Testament expression for angels, but in this case, mutinous angels. That's right. Left their posts, entered into the world, and they had sex with women who then produced monstrous creatures called Nephilim giants. But not only did they sleep with women, we know from the book of Enoch and the book of the giants, which are very old books, which actually predate the flood. And the reason we know of them is because they were written by Noah's family. This whole nonsense of the angels descending and cohabitating with women began in the days of Jared, who was Noah's great, great, great grandfather. And all this revelation was written probably in cuneiform form, passed on to Noah. Noah carried it onto the ark. And that is why scholars believe that those particular books predate the flood. But according to the book of the giants, the book of the Jubilees, the book of the watchers, and the book of Enoch, not only did the angels sleep with women, but they also defiled the animals. How they slept that? with animals. Wow. So here you have early bestiality. Mm -hmm. The women produced giants. The animals that they slept with produced monsters. And there is where you get the root for mythological monsters, which were not mythological. Wow. And in fact, if you study civilizations around the world, every ancient civilization, even ones that never knew each other and had no contact with each other, they all told stories about the same mythological creatures. They just had different names in different places. Okay. Anyway, all of that was going on before the flood when this strange, demonic, fallen, mutinous activity <laughs> happened with angels. Giants and monstrosities were produced and monsters were produced. And finally, the earth was filled with such vileness and wickedness yes. that God knew the only way to cleanse the earth was to send the flood. And this really was not to destroy, it was to cleanse. And the Bible says that Noah was perfect in his generations. Well, that doesn't mean that he was just a good man or spiritually right. That word perfect really means his DNA and his bloodline had never been mixed with this thing that was happening with these fallen angels. Yes. Here was one family that remained pure, and it seemed no one else was pure. God waited until they came to the very end. And one other important thing, Joseph, forgive me, I'm just rambling, but I'm kind of excited. about. Oh, this is this. awesome, Rick. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, God says, I will not always strive with man, for he is yet flesh. And then God says, but his days will be 120 years. What in the world did that mean? Yeah. Listen to the mercy and patience of God. God literally said, okay, guys, here it is. You have messed up completely. You have corrupted yourself. The Bible says all flesh had corrupted his way up on the earth. And that's because when these angels descended, they were celestial beings. They had wings. They were glorious. And to the people at that time, it looked like gods had come down from the spirit realm. And by the way, that is why... Persian culture, Babylonian culture, Sumerian, Chaldean, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, they all have these pictures of gods with wings. It all goes back to Genesis chapter 6. But God said, you guys have messed it up so bad, I'm not going to put up with this forever, so I'm going to give you 120 years to get it right. 
Okay, interesting. Talk about mercy. Yeah. You know, most of us would say to our kids, you make a decision and you do it right now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> but God said, okay, I'm going to give you 120 years to make a right decision. Yep. And during that 120 years, Noah, with his sons, began to build the ark, and they began to preach. Noah was the preacher of righteousness. He tried to call the people to repentance, God giving them space to repent, Wow. But they willed not to repent. And the ancient rabbis amazingly say that when Noah went into the ark, at first the rain began to fall very gently. Well, before that moment, there had never been rain. Rain was a new phenomenon. Hmm. The earth was surrounded with a vapor or a canopy. It was like the whole earth was wrapped in a greenhouse. That's one reason why animals wow. grew large and people lived long lives. Fascinating. And suddenly rain began to fall. Well, this is what the crazy preacher Noah said was coming. <laughs> but the rabbis say it began to fall very gently at first so that people would realize what this man said was going to happen is starting to happen. Wow. And it would give them more time to repent. How about that? But on the seventh day, God saw repentance was not going to happen. So the bowels of the earth opened and the water began to gush from below the crust of the earth. The portals of heaven opened, the rain began to fall, and you know the rest of the story. My but Jesus said the events that occurred before the flood would be replicated, which means we're gonna see some pretty bizarre stuff in our time. Yeah, Rick, and what you're saying is so profound and captivating. Everybody who's watching, I don't know if you're as impacted as I am, but as you're getting this data and information that is really revelatory, I believe it also has ramifications, like you're saying, Rick, for now. You know, there, there could be the possibility of even DNA manipulation and demonic activity among humanity. Again, you look at everything from transgenderism that I believe could end up going into transhumanism. What are your thoughts uh, on that? Trans, Do you have? Tra transhumanism is going to, it's already happening. Right. Right. This is demonic. It is. Like the days of Noah. That, that they had to have a cleansing. God came. I find it interesting in the narrative how much mercy God showed to give people time to repent again and again and again. And yet in all of it, there was that mutilation of a culture and a generation that was supernaturally demonic induced. And I believe that is where we are today. So transhumanism is part of that. Do you believe that's part of the Noah's prophecy? I do. Yes. And if you go to Luke 21, 11, Joseph, Jesus has said something that no translators or commentators have ever been able to understand. Well, there's some things you can only understand as you move forward in time. You know mm. that. Yeah. And in Luke 21, 11, Jesus said at the end of the age, there would be strange signs from the heavens and fearful sights. Wow. Well, when you read that in the Greek text, and of course, that's what I do, it says, from the heavens, the word from is the preposition apo. That word apo in that particular case really means things are going to begin to descend apo from the heavens. Wow. You really can't interpret that any other way. And then when Jesus says there's going to be fearful sights, well, the Greek word is phobotron. That's okay. the only time it's used in the New Testament. It's from the word phobos, which is the word for fear. But when it becomes the word phobotron, it is the Greek word for, are you ready? Monsters. Monsters. So Jesus literally said at the end of the age, strange things are going to descend out of the sky and there will be the appearance of monsters. That's a literal translation. How well, guess that? what? We're living in a time when things are really showing up in the sky all over the place and people are trying to figure out what it is. It's Congressional true. hearings, the Pentagon trying to figure out, the military trying to figure out. I don't know what they are, but things really are appearing in the heavens. Yes. And we're living in a day of monsters. You're talking about all this humanism, genders. You know, my wife and I only come to America twice a year, but the last time that we were there. My goodness. We were sitting in a restaurant, not once, this happened multiple times. And when the person serving us left, I said to Denise, what was that? What, what was that that just served us? Was that a man? Was that a woman? Was that a woman trying to be a man? If, case, that's, if, the, if the case, that's a very ugly man. Was that a man trying to be a woman? If so, that's a scary looking woman. 
And I don't mean to step on a lot of toes. If you look at all the people today that are tattooed all over their bodies and they're spiked all over their beans, it really looks like we're living in the day of monsters. 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 It's part of the prophecy of as the days of Noah. I believe it's repeating itself. It's it's coming to pass again. How how do you know? I was just with you in the wonderful nation you live in, and uh, we got to walk through Red you. Square. I I really Thank enjoyed you. it. One of the best trips I've ever been on in my life was being with you and Denise. Heather and I loved. Well, we it. loved being with you too. Oh my goodness, what a great time! And you know, it's interesting. You, you make a statement, and I find it really fascinating that how you view the news sort of depends on what part of the world you live in. That's and true. How, how do you view the United States right now? And like the, the, the religious climate, maybe the supernatural climate, is there anything that you, you know, uh, you view and maybe a word for the viewers of what's going on in the culture, you know, cause you have a different lens, Rick, and it's really a good one. Well, I wouldn't just say this is about the United States. I would say the Western world. Uh huh but the United States is the trendsetter for the Western world. Right. And what's going on in the United States is absolutely heartbreaking from the highest levels of government to school teachers, people that are being canceled left and right. Yes. Just for saying what they believe. Right. I mean, this is the United States where you're supposed to have freedom of speech. There is, the freedom of speech is already gone. It is yeah. gone. It, it really is. There are, there are thought police all over the place, monitoring, making sure you're saying what you're supposed to say. And if you're not saying it right, they're going to cancel you. They're going to get rid of you. Yes. But hey, Joseph, you know what? It's nothing new. Yeah. In the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus addressed the death of a man whose name was Antipas. You've read about Antipas. Well, his name could have been his name, or it could have been a figurative name, to describe what the world thought about him and thought about Christians, because the name Antipas is from the preposition anti, which means against, yep. and the word pas, which means everything. You put it together, it means somebody who is against everything, Man. which means the world at that time thought Antipas. Ah, he's just narrow-minded, doesn't like anything. He's against everything. Let's just cancel him. Man. If he's not going to blend in, let's just cancel him. And that's yeah. what they did. My goodness. Christians would not bend. Mm -hmm. And the other reason the early pagans hated Christians is because Christians were so exclusionary about their faith. They didn't care that Christians preached about Jesus. There were 3,000 gods in the Roman Empire. Jesus was just another one. What they couldn't stand was that Christians said, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is right. the Lord above all lords. <laughs> That's what they hated. Yes. They said, ah, oh, what bigoted, narrow-minded people. And the world came forward to crush them or to make them compromise. Okay. And what I see right now in the United States is there is such compromise taking place. Right. And I'm so sorry for believers in the U.S. because... They're in a bad position. They've got kids. It's true. That are now going in another direction. Yep. And parents are afraid that if they don't cave for their kids, maybe they're going to lose their kids. People are really in a tough place. But Joseph, even if the world thinks we are Antipas. Antipas. If they think we're non-compliant. Yep. If they think we're unbending. If they think we're narrow-minded, that's all right. The gospel has never changed. Amen. They can even try to cancel us. But you know what? As they try to cancel us, we'll just have more favor with God than we've ever had in our life. Amen. Because we stand by the truth. Yeah, come but on, But that's kind of what I think is going on in the United States. I also believe there's a great hunger swelling in the United States. Absolutely. People are ready for God to do something. Yes. The Christians are tired of all this nonsense. They are. And I believe Christians are crying out for a move of God and God's going to answer them. I, I agree with that completely. And there are signs just before the Lord comes. And, how, you know, you and I both believe that, that the rapture will come. There will be a pre-tribulation narrative. The Bible lays that out. But we are getting closer and closer to those signs and things that are taking place. Where do you see things now? How, uh, before the Lord returns, what do you see happening? How do you read the terrain right now, Rick? Well, first of all, I do believe in the rapture. I want to make that clear. 
It's the word rapture does not appear in the New Testament, but the words right. caught away do, and in Greek it's the same word. Yes. It's the word harpazo. Yes. But to answer your question, that word harpazo, which people call the rapture or the catching away, is a word which means to snatch out of danger just in the nick of time. And it means the rapture is not going to happen in good times. Yep. It's going to happen in bad times, such bad times, it's going to be a divine rescue operation to take us just in the nick of time. But Joseph, there's a secret prophecy in the New Testament. I want to share it with you. Come on, Rick. And this is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul is describing society losing its mind mm. at the end of the age. And by the way, I don't mean to plug a book, but if your readers and listeners don't have my book, Last Day's Survival Guide, they need to get that book. It I will happen really to have one on me, by the way. You didn't know this, but I, I uh, you know, just so you guys know, our viewers, um, Rick has been like one of the greatest mentors in my life through his written material and, and just fellowship and whatnot. But this is that book he's talking about. I encourage you to get it right now at renner.org or any available bookstore. But I just want to say that since you brought it up, I happen to have it here, Rick. It's amazing. Well, I really like that book and it really helps people. But when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, which is what I deal with in that book, there's one thing that I don't really get into in that book, which is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And if you have your Bible, I'm going to share it with you. Okay. So open your Bible. By the way, come are on. you guys reading your Bibles? You need <laughs> to always day. read your Bibles. Every day. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this in verse 8. Now, Paul in this chapter is describing a world gone astray. I mean, the woke culture, the whole business. And then you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. And Paul makes this statement, which doesn't seem to fit into the text, but it really does. He says, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, by the way, the word corrupt describes minds that have been corrupted, reprobate concerning the faith. Well, we're living in the day of reprobate. He's talking about our times. By the way, the word reprobate simply means a mind that is so defective, it no longer believes what is right. It believes a lie is the truth. It believes the truth is the lie. Or just like Isaiah said in Isaiah 520, that black is white, white is black, good is bad, bad is good, just confusion. That's yes. reprobate. Yes. Well, in this verse, he mentions Janes and Jambres. So who are they? These were the two chief sorcerers of Egypt who opposed Moses. And what is interesting is the rabbinical schools, which were located in Alexandria, Egypt, said that Janes and Jambres were relatives of Balaam. No kidding. Balaam was not a backslidden prophet. That word prophet can describe a God's prophet, a pagan prophet. He was just a pagan prophet. And in fact, if you study everything that Balaam did, when he went with Balak to all those mountaintops to try to curse Israel, do you know what he was doing? He was killing animals, opening their guts, trying to read the entrails so that he could see if there was a curse on Israel. Wow. This was pure occult activity. Yes. Balaam was a witch. Wow. And his relatives, it seems, were Janes and Jambres. And Janes and Jambres tried to withstand Moses. Yep. And here, they depict deception in the strongest way. But the Bible says, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. And here you have a prophecy. Yes. That at the end of the age, the church is going to be confronted with great resistance from men of corrupt minds who are reprobate concerning the faith. Wow just like Janes and Jambres tried to withstand Moses. But when they came against Moses, what happened? Oh. God's power erupted on the scene, Come on. and their folly was exposed. Come on. And here's a prophecy. Before we leave this planet, God's power is going to erupt in the church in such a way that it will expose the folly of those that have tried to cancel us, those that are woke, those that are corrupt and reprobate concerning the faith, the power of God is going to be released. So even though we're facing this cancel culture, God's power is going to step up to the plate. That's a hidden prophecy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I think it's amazing. That is a profound word from the Lord. 
You're saying at the end of the age, the Bible has a hidden prophecy, which Rick Renner just revealed to us. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the age, light and darkness are going to collide. I find it interesting, Rick, in that prophecy, it has to do with mysticism, wicked occultic behavior, not, not just the occult, but also cancel culture, all these things. But it also could be wolves in sheep's clothing. It could be angels of light, all of it. What you just revealed to us, I believe, is a hidden piece that is going to really help a lot of people with revelatory understanding that there's going to be a great revealing, even a revival before the very end. That's a powerful thing you shared. Thank you so Thank much. You. Praise God. Amen, brother. Man, everybody who's watching this, I don't know if you're as impacted as I am, but I have to tell you, when Rick begins to speak, it's just so profound and so life-changing for many who hear him all over the world. And I encourage you to share this and whatnot. I also want to say to you very quickly, Rick has several books. And Rick, I want to talk about this very quickly. You wrote this book, Apostles and Prophets. And I just want to say to our audience, everybody watching this, if you don't have a copy of this, this book is the standard. It is the masterpiece of this generation to understand the authority of the apostle and prophet historically and how they operate today. This book is a life changer. It's a must have. I encourage you to get it. Um, I've endorsed it. I've been so honored to be a part of this book. But I encourage you to get it at renner.org. Um, another book that I think is so great that you've done, Rick, this changed my life tremendously, is Light and Darkness. A uh, Light and Darkness has tremendous New Testament understanding, the book of Revelation. It just begins to go into the seven churches. This one deals with the first three or the first two, really, in this book. But I'll tell you, I encourage you guys to check out Renner.org. I encourage you to partner with Rick, and I encourage you to watch him on social media, Facebook, YouTube. And you go on every single day, Rick, every day. I it's do. Amazing. It's amazing. I, I, I live in this chair. <laughs> and where you are right now, and just so people know this, this is Rick's new studio. And it I'll is, tell you, Joseph, it is profound. our partners helped us do this. My wife is sitting right here, and we are just so thankful to every person who gave to help us do this. This really is a miracle, and it's paid for. Praise God. And not only is that our studio, but you know, we have a Russian speaking satellite network which goes around the world, and it's all going from here. Only God could do something like this. <laughs> and Denise and I and our team, we're just so grateful to be in the middle of God's will and for people that have supported us. And Joseph, we're grateful for you. Oh. And by the way, forgive me, but I want to plug one of your books. Okay. If you don't have Joseph's Servants of Fire, get it. Oh. That is the best book I've ever read on the subject of angels. I read wow. it from cover to cover in a single setting. Wow. I learned things about angels I never thought of in my life. And that book is tremendous. Thank you, sir. What, a, what an honor. And thank you for writing the forward to that book. But uh, la ladies and gentlemen, I just encourage you to check out Rick Renner. He's live all the time. And sometimes you'll catch Rick even live. He goes live and he'll answer your questions in real time. I really enjoy that. Rick, you've been such a great voice in my life and the voice of so many people around the world. And I just want to thank you for helping our ministry, being a voice to us. Really, you, you've just been such a blessing, you and Denise have, and your whole thank wonderful you. team out of Tulsa, out of Russia, everywhere. So would you please pray for our audience, Rick, today? I would love to. I was going to ask you if I could. Please. Father, first of all, Denise and I, we pray for Joseph and Heather. We thank you for them. We thank you that you've raised them up. Father, we pray that you keep them in a good place, on a solid path as they reach out to take the living word of God to people. Thank you for the audience that you've given them. Oh, Lord, I thank you. And Father, I pray for every person listening to us today. Lord, a lot of people are tired just because of all the nonsense that's going on in the world. But Lord, I pray that you would give them a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Help them just to reach out and embrace the season and say, Lord, we're anointed for this. We can do this and help them to charge forward by faith. I prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, check out Rick and Denise, renner.org, all their social media. And I'll tell you, Rick, it's an honor to have you. And uh, I just so enjoy your voice. And thank you for everything you've done for the body of Christ. I love you, sir, and I appreciate you. I love you, brother. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please repost this, share this, 
and Jesus is Lord. And remember this, on a bad day, you're called to be, you're anointed actually, to be the very best there is. I love you. Jesus loves you. And we'll see you all again very soon. Thank you so much to Rick Renner. Have a great day, everyone. God bless you. These days, there's a lot of smoke on the topic of angels and spiritual encounters. I don't know if you're like me, but I like results when it comes to the things of God. That's why I believe the Spirit of the Lord had me write this book, Servants of Fire. This is a last day's prayer manual of prophecy, intercession, and angelic activity that really will get results based on the Bible and real horsepower. I encourage you to get your copy today at josephz.com. Well, I am so thankful you're here. You know, this ministry is expanding. We are growing and it is to the glory of the Lord. And I wanna say something to every partner here, whether you are a recent partner or been with us a very long time. From the bottom of our heart, thank you. Partners, because of you, we could not do what we're doing. We're taking territory, we're building new media all the time, we're advancing, we're putting out written materials and giving away content all over the world and we're so grateful to you for it you send us on journeys that cost nothing to the people who are bringing us in and i want to say simply to you thank you now if you want to join our partner family and you're watching i encourage you to do so today you go to josephz.com or you can text the keyword give to 719-259-0029. If you join our partner family, you're gonna hear from us. We will love on you, we will pray for you, we will stand with you over all your dreams and your visions. And I'm telling you what, Heather and I, we constantly are praying for our partners. So please consider, if you're on the fence, join the partner family and let's do this thing together, both in prayer and generosity. We believe that God is going to make all your purpose destiny and dreams come to pass. We're standing with you for it. So thank you for considering partnering with us today. Again, you go to josephz.com. We have a lot of territory to take and we wanna do it together. God bless you. Remember, on a bad day, you're the best there is and you are called to be and shine the light in darkness. I'll see you again next time right here as we continue bringing a now word of the Lord. God bless you.